Okay, so this morning we're, we're going to talk about working in road right of ways. So that's that, you know, the area between the edge of the road and a fence or whatever it is that you're, that designates the part that the Department of Transportation or your local highway departments, depends on the situation, what they take care of. Um, and there are some very specific things we need to be aware of uh, as far as there's legal situations, there's um, just general best practices, and there's also safety, major safety things to think about. So this, um, what I'm presenting is based on what we have in the appendix of the Purple Loose Stripe Biocontrol Guide, um, because we do do so much work in roadways for Purple Loose Stripe, which I really wasn't aware of the degree that we're working in those roadways until I started acting as coordinator. So one of the first things you want to do before you even think about working in the roadway is to contact the right people. In some cases, I've gone out and I've worked with partners who already have those relationships um, started. But if you don't have that relationship, you want to you wanna get that going. I would always also start off with your regional DNR AS coordinator. For, they may be learning in the course of their work projects that are already going on with the different departments that manage the roles. Um, they may have another partner who's already spoken up and said, hey, we're going to work on such and such, and maybe you guys could all partner together and, and work more efficiently. Um, they may just have some other random information that's come up about that particular site. Uh, another thing, of course, is Maybe nobody's ever reported purple loose stripe at that area. So then it becomes a monitoring thing too that you want to get taken care of. Then quite often a good starting point is your county highway department. They'll know who actually manages the right-of-ways that you're interested in and which township to contact. There could be a project planned for the area that could impact your project. You don't want to go put out a bunch of beetles and then find out that the next year they're completely tearing out that entire section of ditch because they're widening the road or something like that. So you want to make sure you're being strategic in your works and this would be a piece of that. And it can, you're going to see in this next um, set of presentations, it's also a great way to start building an ongoing relationship where you could get all sorts of things done. It might be Purple Loose Drive, it might be Phragmites, it could be something we don't even have high on our awareness yet. So it's definitely worth your time. And then there may be an actual road manager that is able to give you permissions some specific guidance and to help you with safety issues. One of the things I wanted to point out that I learned when I was putting together the guide was that the, um, the right of way width is not a single measurement for all roads. It, I'm sure at some point you might have heard that, well, from the center line, it is X number of feet. It really depends on the actual width of the road and it can vary greatly. You can look at the county GIS to see the extent of the right of way width, but beware, sometimes those aren't totally accurate. I mean, I remember working on um, lakes and trying to figure out property lines to do shoreline monitoring and it just, you could see where lines didn't always match up or where you know the hydro layer was off or something like that. So you wanna look for markers and you wanna get that final word from the highway staff you're working with to make sure. Also, fences are quite often installed along the right of ways and they would be actually within three, they'd be three feet inside of the Department of Transportation right of way. Um, it's not always the case, but it's something you can um, at least consider as a starting point. So one of the things 
that's really important is complying with the rules for the Department of Transportation. And um, I wanna mention Krista here, Krista Schaefer, whose address I have listed, worked with me on these rules because she manages, um, or she's a coordinator for the Department of Transportation for Invasive Species. And so she helped me get my ducks in a row to make sure that we were giving good information in the Purple Blue Stripe Guide and then in presentations like this. So the Department of the State Department of Transportation is uh, managing highways that have a number. And they require that you get a permit if that's the case. It's DT 1812. We have um, a link here that'll get put in the chat. Um, and Amanda or Matt, if one of you would just, I don't think I gave you Krista's address there, but if you could just type that in too, thank you. Uh, then things that you need to keep in mind is you should, oh, that's supposed to say median, apologies. Never work in the median unless you are given permission while working directly with the Department of Transportation or the County Highway Department, or it could be someone that they um, designated. Also, not required, but recommended, you should visit the Adopt a Highway Program website and watch the safety video on their safety page. That's another link that we'll put into the chat. Just is really good information. The um, state and other roads often have laws that prevent parking on roadside, so you need to check into that. A um, few of my birding friends found that the hard way in a county road, a couple county roads here in Jefferson County where the police actually stopped and said, sorry, no birding here, which was really sad because there was a really good pond there. And then safety, safety, safety. You wanna wear reflective or fluorescent orange or yellow vests. The road management entity may have specific local rules you should follow, it could be that you know, a law, but there could be other rules like where you can park. Maybe you can work in the right of way, but you need to park off on a side road. Do not stop on interstate highways. I know it's tempting when you see something and you're in monitoring mode, just don't. You should always pull off the road as far as possible and make sure you never block any lanes. Use your hazard lights when stopping or driving slowly to do observations. If you stop to get out and work, put out safety cones. Um, there's also, they're not very expensive. There's the cones that you can plug into your lighter and put on the roof of your car. Have at least one partner with you for extra set of eyes and emergency help. And then beware of wild parsnip. I think this group is probably pretty aware of that already, but your partners may not be if you have volunteers out helping. So make sure they're being safe. They don't end up with those chemical burns from parsnip in the roads, in the ditches. And when you get done, clean off your footwear and brush off any seeds you may have picked up before getting back in the car, just best practices. And if you're doing purple loose stripe work in particular, don't leave the pots because um, I know mowing seems so random sometimes in some of our counties, they can only do it once a year usually. And if they've got those, those pots are out there, then that mower is gonna hit them. You're gonna be creating um, litter on top of just having a mess. Adjacent landowners are important. Make sure you stay in the right of way. Um, if you're doing that, you don't need to contact the landowners, but could be good relationship building. And if they have any concerns, you'd need to assure them that you will stay in the right of way boundary. Okay, those are some basics. And if we have time at the end, we can take questions. But for now, I want to go ahead and hand it off to Chris and Patrick, who are going to handle the first part here. Um, Patrick, I believe you told me you were first up, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing now. Awesome. Thanks, Jeannie. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone see me? Yes. Awesome. 
So yeah, Patrick Swilla, currently still the AIS coordinator in conservation tech for Sheboygan County. So I'm going to be talking about some of the work I've done in the county, especially working with our county highway department specifically. I'll get into the details, obviously, and how we came to do a biocontrol release on the interstate highway. A little bit of background about our project. Uh, 2021, our biocontrol. There's no biocontrol in Sheboygan for several years prior to this year, as far as I was able to find out. I was a new coordinator this year. It was my first time doing biocontrol. So I partnered with Maywood Park. Uh, Sam Lammers, I'm sure many of you know, is the former AIS coordinator herself and was appointed the director at Maywood right around when we were getting this project started. So we partnered together, got a permit to rear beetles on 10 plants at Maywood. Uh, we got rootstock from Kohler Andre State Park where there's some limited loose stripe left, as well as she had some from Washington County right when she was making the transition. We uh, were able to get the plants all set up and everything and had really good success, if you can imagine, as seen in the pictures here, getting them to grow. We did a little uh, educational display, which was really cool, had a lot of interest from Maywood visitors, you know, learning about the program, um, asking lots of questions, potential volunteers down the line, all that kind of good stuff. It was a hard year for beetles. I know a lot of people were having problems with that just based on what I was hearing. Um, we were as well within Sheboygan County. Um, Jeannie actually gave us a tip on a uh, spot in Washington County where she was able to collect some. Um, so thanks for that, Jeannie. We were able to get those added to the plants and the beetles got to work real, real quick, laying eggs and things like that. Um, so that was all set up and good to go. Part of the project is I was also, you know, trying to get a handle on where PL is in the county, uh, where could be good spots for releases, where was it done in the past, et cetera, et cetera, mapping things out, getting things verified and so on. I was able to find out doing some digging um, previously in Sheboygan County, as best I can tell, uh, several pretty strong biocontrol programs in the past. Core Andre State Park, I know, I guess, had a really big biocontrol program in the 2000s along the Black River Marsh. Uh, there's still some signage there um, within the park on the boardwalk there that talks about kind of what they did and how that was able to knock back loose stripe there. YMCA Camp Waikota, which is an environmental kind of outdoor education facility in Sheboygan Falls, they did some mass rearing, I guess, for a few years in the 2010s. They did releases uh, along the Sheboygan River, two sites, uh, the Bull Golf Course, pretty popular golf course, as well as Esslingen County Park, you can see on the map here. So while we're planning this out, you know, we kind of were thinking, okay, we'd like to release at a new area. We ended up choosing the interstate. I'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, and we also planned, you know, we had 10 plants, so we planned to do the majority on the interstate and then also a couple of the plants we plan to release at Maywood and Kohler Andre, just, uh, you know, one to two of them just kind of as a kickback almost for allowing us to grow the plants and um, take the rootstock. They both have limited PL populations with no biocontrol for several years. We wanted to try and reconstitute some beetles in those spots. So why an interstate highway? I mean, why, why on earth would you go about trying to attempt something like that, right? Uh, the main reason is, uh, you know, bad jokes aside, I-43 in Sheboygan County really is impacted with purple loose stripe. It's real prevalent in the medians, along the frontage roads, primarily south of the city and pretty well down to the county line, you know, varying locations. It'll be long linear populations through the majority of the median or throughout the frontage roads. Um, while I was getting the project, you know, geared up, a lot of it wasn't really in bloom yet. Um, we actually, you know, we released earlier in the summer before most of it started blooming, but the pictures you see here are from a lot of the verifications and mapping I was working on this summer, just kind of showing the extent of some of these populations. You know, they're unfortunately really well established. Um, you know, you can see the dead stalks while driving on the highway in the wintertime, and as they started to bloom up later in the summer, um, you can see what you see before you know. So in kind of communicating with my boss, planning conservation department director, as well as Jeannie, you know, we kind of figure this could be a good low hanging fruit while I'm working on getting a handle on PL populations throughout the rest of the county, as well as an opportunity to try and introduce beetles into an area where they may not have been introduced before and try and start knocking back some of this loose strife that's so prevalent along the highways. Um, as if that wasn't enough of a reason, we also had a little bit of an added incentive of why to release on an interstate highway. Um, the area where we ended up choosing to release that ended up working out is pretty close to a large county-owned preserve along Lake Michigan called the Amsterdam Dunes Preserve. It's 200 some acres. Uh, and it was actually just approved as a wetland mitigation bank in 2021, which is kind of a big deal. I guess there's not a lot of banks in this region. So 
there's a lot of restoration ongoing at the property as part of that to kind of get it up to par, if you will, for the banking process. And part of the being a wetland mitigation bank is you can't have invasive species composition, you know, percent composition within the bank itself over a certain percentage. And so that was a big point of emphasis, emphasis from my boss, the planning and conservation department director of trying to introduce beetles to that part of the county where as far as we could tell, they hadn't been introduced before um, in, you know, in impacted areas, the interstate currently, uh, with the hopes of trying to be able to prevent purple loosestrife from eventually spreading into the preserve and into the bank. <clears throat> as far as coordinating the actual release, uh, when I started looking into things and figuring out, you know, where I ended up wanted to, wanting to do the release, um, poking around on our GIS, I found that several of the interstate parcels in our county are actually owned by the county, which I'm not sure if that's common to other counties or not. Um, doing some digging, I guess they apparently have owned them since like the 60s or something, and they are involved with the management. We're a county department, uh, the county highway department obviously would be the ones involved with that management. And so for us, the process kind of consisted of coordinating through our county departments. You know, I would communicate with my boss, planning conservation director. He would communicate with the highway department director and coordinate kind of getting the necessary approvals and such um, in place. And they were able to take care of that, get us permission to access do the release, work along the highway, you know, breaking the rules that Jeannie just laid out, um, being able to stop on the highway. I'll talk about how we're able to do that, following safety considerations and best practices that they laid out for us. Things that they wanted to know um, as part of that process were, you know, why are you doing this? What are you doing? What's the purpose? Um, when do you anticipate doing the work and doing the actual release, which as anyone who's done loose stripe knows, it can be kind of hard to predict. As if that wasn't enough, uh, we had the added caveat. They let us know that there was going to be construction work going along the interstate uh, throughout the summer, including this area you see here on the map where we were planning to do the release. Um, it was going to change daily. And, you know, under no circumstances are we to interfere with that work. So if they happen to be working where we want to work, uh, that's a no-go. So, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit coming up. Plan for some contingency locations. You know, have your pie in the sky, ideal location next near the dunes where I'd like to release, but also plan a few locations on these other county parcels where it could be feasible to actually do the release. Logistically speaking, uh, the information that they, you know, communicated to my boss and then down to me, safety considerations, a lot of the same stuff that uh, Jeannie was mentioning. In order to be able to stop and work along the interstates, um, they were requiring us to use a truck with strobes, essentially needing a highway maintenance vehicle, if you will, and Luckily, our, our department happens to have a former highway maintenance vehicle converted to a conservation truck. Um, it's got strobes, it's got appropriate markings and all that kind of stuff to be able to stop along the highway and safely work, um, use high visibility clothing, use the buddy system and be extremely cautious when parking and re-entering traffic. You know, use those strobes to your advantage, look for gaps and, you know, just really be smart about it. Use your common sense. Generally be alert, you know, you're going to be working in a dangerous situation. So, you know, have your wits about you, have a good plan going into it. Plan, you know, we planned everything out really kind of meticulously. We planned a parking, a stopping location, plan to use a median U-turn where you often see, you know, police or service vehicles stopped kind of at their suggestion. Um, but as I mentioned, due to the ongoing construction work, we wanted to have some contingency spots of other uh, locations that could be um, good to do in case we get, you know, um, impeded on our day when we're trying to get out and we're not able to access that spot. Fortunately for me, I actually live in Grafton, so I was able to kind of monitor this daily on my drive into work when I knew we were leading up to the release. So I was able to kind of see where the construction was taking place and how things were progressing and kind of really get a good, get a good idea of picking out these different spots where we could potentially do the work. Another point of emphasis they had, um, you want to work efficiently, you know, have everything planned out, like I said, divide up the tasks, so you can minimize the time spent working within the median. Don't spend any more time than you need to. Don't dilly dally, obviously anything like that. Not that you would want to. I mean, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but working in that situation, you know, the blood's pumping, the adrenaline's rushing. So you wanna kind of keep your wits about you and make sure you've got a good plan going into it. As Jeannie mentioned, we plan to remove the plants from the pots. So we didn't have to make a return trip. And we really knew that we were gonna have one shot to do this. You know. That's something I'm going to talk about in a second, but kind of coordinating both use of this truck, our schedules, schedules with other staff, and then also timing out when the Beatles are going to release, so or um, be ready to release, rather. So 
on that note, logistics from the loose stripe side of things, um, I'm sure, you know, preaching to the choir, everyone knows it can be really hard to time when that release is going to be ready to happen. When are the beetles going to pop? When are your host plants going to start dying? I mentioned getting to make sure we can use this maintenance vehicle. And um, so what happened to us is over a long hot weekend, I think right around maybe a little before 4th of July, came in Monday, went to Maywood to check on the plants. And most of them over the weekend had just sustained super heavy damage from the larval feeding. I and mean, they were real crispy, real window paned over from the larvae chewing them up. And a lot of them were dying really quickly, um, which, you know, going through the guidance, I understand. Got to get those plants out as soon as possible. So the way we ended up doing it, you know, I knew I could coordinate the highway release for later in the week. So we ended up doing our mini release of the three plants with the most larval damage. Did that at Maywood and Color Andre to buy a few more days for more new adults to emerge on the other plants. But again, just on the rate of how they were chewing through these guys, um, our highway release ended up being quite a bit of larva, but with some new adults having emerged as well. You can see in the pictures here, you know, this is from when we did the release at Maywood. So I don't know if you can see quite well, there's some larva shown on that uh, bottom picture. And we had a couple of helpers, um, I believe Sam's nephew, um, helping us out through the day. So that was a lot of fun. When it came to the day to do the release, um, of course, on my way in, I noticed that uh, the median U-turn I planned to use for parking was blocked by construction equipment. So cool, cool, awesome. How are we gonna shift? How are we gonna adjust? Well, uh, fortunately, perhaps, um, as part of that, they were staging equipment, it turns out, and they had actually closed off one lane of the interstate, the lanes closest to the median, either side, going north and south. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so this lane is closed. That could potentially have actually created an area for us that could be a safe spot to stop and work. The construction crews weren't yet working there. They were still several miles up the highway. And so I'm thinking if we can get in and do this thing right away in the morning, um, that's going to be, you know, the best possible option. We can still get to the area where we had planned to do the release close to the dunes, um, just a little farther down um, from the U-turn that we had planned to use. So communicated that to my boss, he communicated to the highway department, got the green light to go ahead and do that. And we're able to kind of get the truck packed up. You can see in the picture here, um, get out to the highway use the strobes to find a gap in traffic and safely pull over within the coned area. And we pulled way over, you know, we almost had the truck all the way in the median to make sure that not only were we not within that lane that's closed, but not even within the shoulder really, to make sure that we had plenty of space to work, cars going by us, um, another added benefit, the traffic speed was reduced by having that extra lane closed. So it actually kind of ended up being a blessing um, that this is how the situation worked out. Um, that we were able to use this as a safe place to access and do our work. Uh, you can see this picture, just me standing in the median here. Um, at the time we did the release, the loose stripe hadn't really bloomed yet, but you can see all those dead stalks and young plants and they run, I don't know, it's probably pretty well quarter, half mile through the median in that particular location. We set about doing the release. As I mentioned, we had divided the tasks up. so. Sam's unloading the truck. I'm taking photos, coordinates, filling out the data sheets, you know, for both the release as well as to do a verification on the population. She placed the plants at kind of regular intervals um, throughout this linear population. And then we worked together to remove the netting, remove the plants from the, lot, um, from the pots, making sure to take care and in intertwining the leaves. Um, you can see how dead and crispy some of these plants were looking to make sure that the larva, you know, as I mentioned, we had a predominantly larval release. Um, make sure they had a, a bridge to get over to their new host plants um, so they could safely happily thrive, start knocking back some of this loose strife. All in all, I'd say it probably only took maybe 15, 20 minutes that we were working with in the median. Um, it was kind of mid-morning, so traffic wasn't really that bad. The adrenaline definitely is pumping and you're kind of feeling like a little on edge doing it. But honestly, just from a personal uh, anecdote, I didn't really feel terribly unsafe doing this kind of work. I felt as though we were really well prepared. Guidance from our highway department, the safety precautions we had taken, working together, um, it, it kind of really made the whole process streamlined um, and able to, able to get out there and do this release. That's honestly pretty much it. We, you know, we got out of there, we were able to find a gap in traffic to leave through that coned area and re-enter the highway, turn around at a different exit, get back to the office, um, Give a recap to the highway department afterwards, fill them in on how it went, let them know that we're done. We're not gonna need to go back. 
the project was, you know, pretty much completed. Get the data entered into SWIMS, clean up all the loose strife gear, and gear up for the next time, right? So that's pretty much all I've got, honestly. It was a pretty quick, um, streamlined process as far as working through our county departments. Um, that was really um, help help things move along as far as I'm concerned, as far as I could tell. And I don't know if we're doing questions now, Jeannie, but I'd be happy to take some if there's a few minutes. Otherwise, um, you know, thanks everyone for their time. Yeah, let's go ahead and roll over to Chris AC. So you just need to stop sharing so that he can. Yeah, let's see. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, following up uh, Patrick's presentation, uh, talking about uh, another Purple Loose Drive project that um, worked in road areas, uh, right away areas. Um, so we'll jump right in here. For those of you that don't know me, um, Chris AC with the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance up in Northeast Wisconsin, based out of Appleton. Um, one of the AIS coordinators uh, regionally, but just not with DNR. Um, so I know we got about 30% of this uh, folks who had their first meeting. So always like to make sure, okay, first introduction, let's uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. Talking about the project site uh, itself, we did a, a purple loose drive project um, for the first time in, in 2021 here at Fox Wolf. Uh, and we scouted several locations during 2020. Um, with COVID, with fewer meetings, we took some extra time to scout some new locations for potential projects in 2021. And on some of my uh, mapping projects, I found um, a purple loose drive site in uh, a suburb north of Fond du Lac called Tai Chi. Uh, aerial photo of the uh, work site, you can see it's a, it's a park and ride that's located north of town. Um, there's quite a few open fields on here. So this, the project area that we're actually working in is between road 151 here and Winnebago Drive. So this parking lot is a, a park and ride. Um, but I'd gone and I'd seen that those purple loose drive kind of inter, uh, intermixed um, through a lot of these fields. Um, and I didn't see any beetle damage when I'd been looking in 2020. So we hadn't done biocontrol uh, projects before, but I knew this was one that, this was an area that was gonna be perfect for one of these biocontrol projects. Um, as we're planning this in 2020, we're like, okay, 2021, we're going to be uh, a little bit back, more back to normal. So we can plan some trainings. Um, what our original idea for doing Purple Loose Drive projects was let's partner with a uh, nature center or a school or something like that. Still wasn't an option for us in 2021. We had a couple nature centers that we had talked about in 2019 partnering with for Purple Loose Drive. And I said, oh, we still can't start it due to COVID. Um, so that was part of our problem. Um, okay, so what's the next option for us? Okay, what about the, the Fox Wolf office? Well, Fox Wolf moved offices between April and June of 2021. So right when you need to have plants. So that wasn't going to work. And the, and the new space and the old space didn't really allow for plants. And in my apartment, a lot of uh, coordinators have mentioned that they used um, their backyards or their patios for plants. And I don't have enough outdoor space for that. So keeping with our 1980s movie theme, I felt a lot like Doc Brown in Back to the Future, where I just, you know, every, every turn I would go, I'd be like... <clears throat> Rats, that's not gonna work. Turn another direction, that's not gonna work. So trying to think about what's the next option for us. And thinking back through presentations we had seen over the year, my mind jumped to a picture uh, of Kathleen Higley that uh, she had presented on. Um, but this picture had stuck in my head of, okay, it's purple loose drug biocontrol, but it's in situ, it's in the field. This was a, a, a site that Kathy's talked about a lot, but it's a wetland. So there was water, quite a few purple loose drug plants. So I thought, okay, would something like that then work for this bizarre 2021 that we're looking at? So I went down and looked at the site again when it was a little bit warmer um, in March timeframe, saw how tall some of the plants had gotten um, and said, oh, I, okay, I think, I think we can give it a shot. There's gonna be some, some challenges like with any project. So let's figure out what those are. First one, of course, was figuring out, okay, it's a park and ride, but who's organizing, who's owning the, the, the property? Um, like Jeannie had talked about her first presentation, there's a couple different ways to go about and do this. Um, in Fond du Lac County, 
they have uh, on their website a GIS uh, tax parcel map. So that made it really easy to go on their website and find, okay, who owns this site? And it was Wisconsin DOT, which is nice. The entire site, the entire orange surround area is all owned by DOT. So then it was thinking, okay, what are the permits that are gonna be needed? First, of course, the purple loose drive biocontrol. So email Genie to get that going. But then the question arose, do we need a DOT permit? Worked with Jeannie to get in touch with Krista Schaefer um, and found out that, yeah, we would need this uh, uh, work on a highway right of way permit uh, to do this work. So uh, she connected me with a, a local um, Wisconsin DOT maintenance staff member in Northeast Wisconsin called Matt Hafes, and he helped me uh, really get this application um, in very quickly, reviewed very quickly, and approved very quickly. Really, as soon as they found out that all the work was gonna be done in the fields, it wasn't gonna be uh, blocking any roadways. There was no project that was gonna be closing uh, traffics or anything like that. It turned very quickly into a, oh, of course you can do this. It's not causing any problems. And so the turnaround, once I got the permit actually submitted was about two or three days after about a week or so of conversations, uh, trying to inform them that this is not gonna impact traffic whatsoever. So then we get into some more of the challenges with the project. And this was looking at, okay, we're in the middle of a field, how are we gonna hold up the nets? So I tried a couple different approaches. The first was like in this photo, we used tomato cages uh, on some of them with the purple loose strap netting around it. And then looking at that photo from, from Kathy, it was, okay, it looks like it's tied to a tree, maybe to a stake, maybe we can use stakes uh, in this project. So went out into the wetland and worked to construct a support system for nets around some of the plants. Of course, not everything went to um, plan as we're constructing this because it was a wetland. So I was trying to, I set my phone on a timer, hit uh, to get some pictures of the site beforehand, hit the button to start the timer, ran over uh, to start, you know, hammering um, to get a, an action shot. And sure enough, it was an action shot. I uh, fell over right after the photo was taken. So uh, we had a lot of fun uh, presenting to this to our county staff members when they were asking about the project of, how did it go? Well, it was, it was essentially these two photos of best laid plans and things changed a little bit. One of the concerns with this site was how do we avoid tampering or removal of these uh, support systems of the purple loose rife nets? Um, what we did is we actually contacted the, the Fond du Lac County Maintenance Department. Their building is, from this pic picture's perspective, about 200 yards behind uh, where I'm taking this picture. So they would know about it. Um, as they were the ones who usually mowed it, we found out. And then we also constructed uh, and put together these signs. And we saw this as a great opportunity to mix a information about what's going on in this site. All of a sudden, people that use this park and ride every day are going to wonder what's going on with these net nets, as well as to have some information on there of here are the permit numbers. And I thought um, that was something that was recommended to us by DOT and I believe by Jeannie as well, saying put those permit numbers on there so if anybody has questions, they can look it up specifically. And thinking about what could possibly happen with this site, we wanted to have some information on there of, hey, if you see anything wrong with this, if there's vandalism, if a storm came through and knocked something over, here's our phone number, here's who we are, give us a call so we can come down and fix it right away. Um, I'm putting this up, it's starting to get late. These are, these are some of the twilight photos I'm taking. And then I, I get the net set up, everything's looking great, I'm really happy, and then all of a sudden I think, I didn't make a plan for how I'm gonna secure the bottom of the netting. Okay, so uh, WWJD and WWBD. And that would be, what would Jeannie do? What would Brock do? So we MacGyvered a situation, uh, MacGyvered a solution. So what we did was using some of the extra zip ties, actually hold the netting down um, and creating a couple small holes in the very base of that netting and then uh, lettering some grasses on it so it could stay for a couple days until I came back with some additional rock uh, to really weigh down those nets. Worked with... Uh, uh, Megan and Amanda uh, from DNR to collect beetles. Um, and this was a, a great collaboration because it was not only for our project, but also partners locally. So beetles collected were used um, by Oneida Nation, Green Bay Botanical Garden, a couple other partners. But it mirrored the, across the rest of the state where it was a tough beetle year. So we mostly um, were, when we collected, we collected maybe a quarter of what we wanted of actual beetles and the rest um, were either um, eggs on leaves that we hoped would hatch 
And it's just from this site, that's what we were finding. I know uh, Megan and Amanda did some additional uh, beetle collection later on, um, but for what I used in this project, that's what I did. So I took uh, those beetles, um, the leaves with the eggs, put them, dropped them down into the nets and said, we'll see what happens here with this very strange 2021. So time passes as time does. Used volunteers to kind of check those nets weekly for any issues. Um, volunteers being folks who had worked with Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance before who lived down in that area. A couple of my seasonal interns worked down there and they drove past it as on their way to boat launches. So they were able to keep an eye on it. And when I'm setting up this project, I had two or three people come up to me and ask what's going on. I would explain the project and then immediately their ask was, how can we help? Or is there something we can do? And I said, yes. If you're out here all the time, please keep an eye on it. And let me know if you see anything. So we had a, a great group of um, volunteers to keep checking on the project. And that was just looking for structural damage and net blows over things like that. And I'm happy to say it worked well. There was no issues during the course of the project. Uh, apparently my construction skills in terms of temporary support systems was, was fine. It didn't blow over in a couple storms that came through, nothing happened and then no vandalism either. How it went and this is where it got kind of tricky it, it felt like the rest of 2021 really where it was like eh, okay it's kind of changed it's kind of the same we got some mixed results so on some of the the plants uh two of the five um netted plants showed beetle damage one plant in particular showed significant beetle damage and that's plant number two there um, but for three of the plants there was really no um beetle damage done and in fact um, some of the plants were actually taller that were in the nets than some of the surrounding plants that weren't in nets. So it was one of those frustrating situations. You can see some of the some of the additional beetle damage that was done. Part of the reason the netted plants actually uh, grew larger um, and more robust was um, when I came back in July. Uh, I checked on the project every two to three weeks myself. When I came back, I actually found beetle damage on surrounding plants. So between the time I had started the project and that now, now we're in mid-July, uh, beginning of August, beetles from other purple loosestrife projects from years past, other areas, had colonized the area. So it was one of those like, well, okay, well, no matter what, beetles are now in this area. So that's going to be a good thing. Um, did want to mention, because this was working with highway departments, I wanted to continue to have great communication with Krista. Uh, at Wisconsin DOT with Matt, our local uh, Northeast Wisconsin maintenance person, as well as the county staff um, from Fond du Lac County to, to let them know, here's what's happening with the project. Here's how things are going. And with that, I'll kind of wrap it up. Um, it was a, an interesting first year for Purple Loose Drive uh, with, with mixed results. Thank you, Chris. And then we're going to go ahead and if you guys are having questions, go ahead and put them in the chat so we can keep rolling here. Um, in fact, Chris, you've got one from Stephanie right now. And then um, Patrick and Marissa are going to tag team the next section. So if you want to go ahead and stop sharing and then they can share theirs. Marissa, you want to put it up? I know me too. Um, if you could, that would be great. I'm not totally sure how to do that. All right, look good on everyone's end. Looks good. All right, I'm back again. So yeah, Patrick and I'm, uh, tag teaming this one with Marissa, kind of as we were going through and planning these presentations a month or so ago, we realized that we have really similar stories with this, what we're going to talk about today and ended up doing pretty similar projects. Um, so that's kind of why we're going to tag team this one. So I'll let Marissa introduce herself and get us going. Yes, yeah, so I'm Marissa Ullman. I work for Jefferson County in the Land and Water Conservation Department, um, but part of my position is funded through the LMPN grant to do invasive species work. So that's how I got linked up with the highway department here and to help them manage their invasive species. You wanna go to the next slide? Um, so really how this started out was that um, the highway department was spraying in the roadsides and 
found what they thought to be giant hogweed. Um, turns out that it was actually Angelica, and the property that they were spraying near was actually a prairie restoration through the Madison Audubon Society. Um, so they were understandably pretty upset that this restoration they'd been working on had just been sprayed by the highway department. And come to find out, they had actually misunderstood where the right-of-way ended and were also pretty far into the restoration on private property. So um, we heard from them directly and they gave some public comment at the highway committee meeting. Um, and it was actually the highway department that reached out to us and Land and Water First to see if we could help provide their staff with some training um, on identification of invasive species in the area. Um, obviously hogweed, but also some wild parsnip, which is a big problem in our area. And they had been having some injuries uh, related to that. And yeah, so very similar story in Sheboygan County. I was kind of approached by some of the highway department workers in August. Um, same thing, they I guess had a pretty long history of repeated injuries to new staff working along the roadsides within the county from wild parsnip, uh, getting the burn, sap on their skin, burns and stuff like that. Um, and so they were looking for, and they were looking with uh, a desire to kind of map out some of these problem areas and increase awareness, stuff they can share with new staff. Hey, this might be some spots you want to avoid um you know to prevent this issue with getting burns and help track some other other invasive uh, hot spots um so essentially you know they were looking for some direction and mapping the invasives using uh the survey equipment gis programs and apps that they already have in place and are using for other things um, i was using some similar stuff which i'll talk about a little bit next um, some methods for some invasive species surveys and so kind of marrying those things, two things together, how can we use these methods with your apps and equipment um, to get you guys going on some mapping? Um, as part of that, I also kind of provided them with some identification brochures, cards, resources. I was fortunate that the um, contacts I was working with, it's a survey crew, um, seemed to really be pretty knowledgeable about kind of the main invasive species. And so we're comfortable kind of with those ones, but some, some just some resources they can provide to new staff to kind of help out with those. So after that phone call where they reached out to us to um, have some help with identification training, I went over to their department and gave them a presentation on how to identify the most common and abundant species in our counties and differentiate them from lookalikes. And I got them using the Seek app as well, if you're not familiar with that. It's a really great um, smartphone app that uses the camera and you can just shoot it at plants. And it's actually been pretty reliable in my experience. Um, and so they were really excited about all that training. And we actually ended up doing a sort of impromptu, impromptu field trip um, to go look at some of the sites that they were currently managing in the county and confirm that uh, what they thought they were managing was actually correct and that they were um, using the correct methods to manage those things. Um, and then the first immediate re result of this meeting was that we began sharing our GIS resources and map access. Um, and enabled a photo attachment on our layers um, so that we could better communicate about identification. And so that point about including GIS staff, um, which was really cool that we both had this shared experience was really integral to how I got connected with this particular subset of highway workers to get them involved with doing some roadside mapping. And so, uh, so in Sheboygan County, I'm sure this is real similar to a lot of other counties. You know, we use Esri, GI, ArcGIS software programs, apps, et cetera, um, across many departments for a variety of different um, purposes. Highway department uses collector app pretty often to track bridge and culvert locations, other roadway features. I, in my work this summer, AIS coordinator in the other half of my job was working under a GLRI grant using the field maps app and the, kind of that technology to do some invasive species mapping on state owned riparian property. So I had layers set up, you know, to track invasive species and percent composition within polygons, you know, list of common species, ability to input treatment data down the line and things like that as part of that project. Um, and essentially what happened is this crew of highway workers is a survey crew that kind of got this whole thing started, basically just noticed my layers on our server and started asking our GIS staff questions about, hey, can we use this? Can we use this to track invasive species? We think it could be helpful for our work as well. Um, GIS staff bridged the gap to me. So we were able to kind of, you know, get that relationship started. And I was able to work with them and the GIS staff to create a new layer for them to use. Um, so they wouldn't be, you know, putting it on the one I'm using, but putting it on their own that can be their own where they can use it to start to track some of these invasive locations. 
Um, you can see, you know, they, so they started this and I want to say like August, early, mid August. And the background of this slide here is actually some of the progress they've made so far with different points and polygons color coded by species um, on a lot of the roadways throughout the county. So from their side of things, they can use this to say, hey, here's where parsnip is, you know, don't, when you're working there, be careful, wear gloves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as it's um, very useful for the field staff as well. It's compatible with both these apps and I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit more um, in a second here. So following the meeting, I was provided access to their department's spraying and mowing related maps. Um, and that data allowed me to see where they were spraying, what they're spraying, which herbicide they're using and who was doing it. So I was able to sort of check up on their other activities to see where they were managing things in the county. Um, and they also created a map for me within their department files to mark invasive species population during my work related things so that they could also have access to it and we could more easily work together um, to manage these new populations we were finding in the county. Um, so, you know, that allows me to see where they're already managing things and I can make them aware of these new populations that they can add to their docket of management locations next time they go out spraying or mowing. Um, and so this next part we'll talk about is that photo attachment that has been a big help um, that Patrick will talk more about here. Yeah, so really the beauty of doing this kind of mapping is it's a two-way street. So we in the office can view what you can see on the left side of your screen, the desktop view, um, showing the species, the location, lat long, who put it in, fields, options for treatments and things like that. If you had other species that aren't in your drop-down list. And at the same time, the workers in the field can view what you see on the right on their phone, which is essentially showing the same information. Um, so, you know, we can use the photo attachment field to check the ID, you know, ensure the correct species are being tracked and kind of keep tabs on how some of these, you know, hotspots or whatever you want to call them are looking along the roadways. But then on the roadside worker, you know, side of things, they're able to view in their phone in real time. You know, these apps, the phone and desktop of the server is syncing itself every 15 minutes. So and I think you can set that to be even a quicker interval if you want. Um, so they can see in real time, you know, where these things are popping up spots that they may want to avoid or they want to be extra um, safe when working in or to just kind of help shape their management decisions down the line. You know, in Sheboygan County, it's kind of just starting this process. So I'm hopeful that they can use this to kind of take it to the next level, um, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit coming up. Um, and this is just one example, you know, the whole parsnip story that I'm sharing here. And we both found there's a variety of um, further needs and concerns raised by the roadside workers within these highway departments which again ended up being, you know, before we even talked to each other, like really mirror image, same kind of things we're hearing from both sides of it. So I'll let Marissa start with her side. Yeah, so I had a lot of takeaways from our initial meeting. Um, I thought there was a lot of opportunity to improve their management plan in the roadsides. Um, and I learned that their work plan is based on their Wisconsin DOT protocols. And so that would have to be taken into consideration if they were to adjust their management activities. Um, I also found that their roadside invasive best management practices are very general. They're from the Wisconsin Council on Forestry, um, and the county doesn't really have specific direction either from the DOT or in-house when they're putting together these management plans. Uh, they also felt, I think, a little overwhelmed by the amount of species and information that were regulated by NR40 or disseminated by those um, governing bodies. Um, so that combination of lack of experience with these individual species and the overwhelming amount of general information led to a lack of prioritization and structure and direction in their management efforts. Um, so without a clear plan, they really were feeling very defeated is what they were saying to me because they would continue to come back and manage these same locations of wild parsnip or teasel year to year and then find it continue to come back. And so it felt really like they were fighting a losing battle. Um, so I definitely saw that they had the staff time and equipment at their disposal to effectively manage these populations. They just needed more direction and support when they were putting together their planning and management efforts. So a lot of the things I was finding with the survey crew I was working with the highway department, these are some thoughts and just concerns that they raised um, when I was talking with them, were almost mirror image to what Marissa just said, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it makes sense. But um, so as you mentioned, you know, their ability to maintain roadways is affected by invasive species based on, you know, the DOT prescribed 
best management practices, including mowing schedules. And something they brought up that I thought was interesting that I hadn't really thought about before is you're following these schedules and you're skipping an impacted area at a particular time of the year to decrease the spread. It could turn the shoulders and roadsides into a patchwork of, you know, short and tall vegetation, which again, is something I hadn't really ever considered, you know, so that from their perspective, it can be aesthetically unpleasing to look at potential for citizen complaints, people calling like, did you even mow this area? Oh, well, this is why we can't in this particular time and things like that. Um, and these workers, they know that there isn't a one size fits all solution, but in our particular case, their current practices feel a bit more like a band-aid than true management in some cases, as Marissa alluded to, you know, the feeling of fighting a losing battle when you're, you know, oh, we're not, we're trying to control this teasel or this parsnip and it just keeps coming back continually year after year. And something they expressed to me that was a little discouraging is, you know, lack of funding or ex resources for extensive mapping or control projects um, and just kind of the guidance there uh, was a little discouraging. So we both really had very similar feedback um, uh, on that side of things. And that's, as, as far as my story goes, that's about as far as where things are at in Sheboygan County currently. You know, they're interested in learning about additional funding or resources to kind of supplement the mapping that they've started to do. And um, Marissa is going to go into some of the awesome work that she's been doing, which I think is just a super great example of kind of how to take the relationship to the next level. Yeah, so after um, talking with them about what their frustrations were and what their needs were, um, I started brainstorming about how to provide them with more direction in their planning. Um, and I felt like the first step in general was to define our priority species between both of our departments. And we came to understand that wild parsnip was going to be a little bit different than the other species, how we were gonna manage it just because of how widespread it was in our county. So we decided that we were gonna select priority locations with that species in particular. And so then the next course of action I felt like would be to provide the, them with county specific recommendations and education that is really tailored to our needs. Next slide, please. Um, so what I came up with was this extensive resource binder um, and I provided this binder to both the operations manager for the highway department and the spray crews. Um, and I, I began with a summary of the decontamination methods for their equipment as well as how to incorporate invasive management into planning and prevention ideas into the work that they're doing. And that includes the Wisconsin Forestry Council um, best management practices for roadside vegetation. I also created a master work plan for the eight species that we'd highlighted as our priorities as an annual seasonal timeline and emphasize the time management that focuses on the species specific life cycles. So that's that top table there. And after that, there are species profiles with ID characteristics, life cycle and management techniques for those top eight priorities. Um, and that is gonna include um, the rate of spread, difficulty control, and um, additional things of note about those species like allelopathic tendencies or safety concerns. And so that's that table in the middle there. Um, I also included at the end the herbicide labels for the products that they have available to them and what those active ingredients are and which species they're going to be most effective on. But I think the crux of this binder is that each of these main sections has a one-page summary or a summary table that is really the bottom line for each of these ideas. So although they have this wealth of information required to make or adjust these large management decisions, um, they have at the top a quick and dirty highlight of the information that makes it more accessible to them than just drinking from a fire hose, which I think is what they were feeling prior to this. Um, so the other thing about this is it was really, I was able to customize it for our needs. So I think that was what was sort of lacking was this local information, locally important. So next slide, please. So now they have all these great resources about species specific management techniques. And the next question is how do they roll it into their existing work plans? So I was able to get in touch with Chris Schaefer from the DOT, who's been mentioned a couple of times now uh, related to invasive species work and learn more about the requirements for the highway department and potential opportunities to adjust their work plans. Um, so she, focuses on long-term maintenance for the DOT. She's a landscape architect and has also worked with IPAW, which is the Invasive Plant Association of Wisconsin. So she had some good background um, in invasive species and some limitations she was able to help me identify to species-specific management, which Patrick kind of already alluded to, was that 
Boeing is only reimbursed once or twice a year and has a deadline due date set by the DOT as part of their contract. Um, so those activities being reimbursable and having those rigid structure might be a little bit of a hurdle. Um, but I also learned that the deadline for Jefferson County is July 1st, and that's actually already as a result of our wild parsnip problem here is they want to get that before it seeds so that we run into less safety concerns and injuries as the season goes on. Um, I also learned one way that it could be possible to incorporate wild parsnip management into their plans could be through safety mowing. And safety mowing is this additional mowing that they can do that would be reimbursable that's not limited to a specific number of times per year or size or areas. Um, it's really just to protect the safety of the workers. So that could be used for parsnip possibly in these problem areas or even Phragmites if that's causing sightline issues in you know, vision corridors. Um, another couple programs that it would be important to know um, that might have different requirements for mowing are pollinator habitat projects or there's a Monarch CCAA program in some areas of the state that could affect the ability to adjust the management of those areas. Um, and what I heard from her about the top three species of concern from DOT was wild parsnip, of course, because of the safety concerns, Phragmites, because of how aggressive it is and the problems it can cause with sight lines, and Japanese knotweed, because of the concerns with infrastructure damage in terms of concrete and bridges, and you know, we know it can damage uh, retaining walls and things like that. So um, for us, particularly, as I mentioned before, in Jefferson County, wild parsnip is going to be the um, biggest species to tackle for us. So we're beginning by choosing priority sites, as I mentioned, rather than adjusting just the management technique or the timing for that. And so naturally, those priority sites are going to be where people are going to encounter it most. Um, so for those highway departments, it's going to be their beam guards, their bridges, their culverts, their road signs. Um, we also brought up biking and hiking trailheads and parking spaces, which we have a lot of in our county, um, and waterways where there's access for paddlers or fishermen could also be included. And that uh, we identified as an opportunity to collaborate with our parks department on that management. Um, and the good news is about these priority areas in terms of bridges, signs, culverts, is they already have existing layers in their GIS systems where all these areas are in the county. So we're in the process of utilizing that existing shapefile data to create a wild parsnip priority management location layer that they can utilize in the field when they're out working to target these locations specifically. So once desired control is achieved, we can buffer the, those features and expand them to create our increasing management area across the county. Um, this will give us an opportunity to refine our management techniques in these priority areas before taking on the county as a whole. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, in talking to Krista, I also learned that the DOT, similar to the DNR, has the state split up into five regions. Um, and currently, the regional trainings that are provided for departments are focused on maintenance requirements and providing guidance on fulfilling their county contract with the state. So there aren't any staff positions in the DOT that are tasked with or capable of really providing plant ID or invasive species management specific trainings, um, even on a regional level, let alone a local level. Um, so the resources they provide for AAS management, um, as I mentioned before, are from the Wisconsin Council on Forestry and aren't locally specific. Um, so apparently they encourage their departments quite a bit to seek out education opportunities with local contacts, such as area coordinators, county staff, SISMAs, and other volunteer groups. Um, and essentially, I've come to learn that there is a momentous need statewide for this type of partnership that Patrick and I are now beginning to establish with our highway departments. Um, there's a need for specifically local customized recommendations and clear management directions for invasive species. Um, and although funding specific to AIS is non-existent in the DOT and their contracts, um, their work plans and contract requirements appear to be flexible enough to allow for adjustments that would result in better management of AIS, um, specifically the previously mentioned safety mowing or simply just adjusting the time of year what that deadline is that you mow at to be more conducive to the species that you're battling. Um, so I think this means the key to encouraging departments to adopt more efficient invasive species management plans 
is by illuminating how they can integrate these practices into their existing workload without incurring further costs to their department and really driving home that the benefits of taking the time and effort to manage emerging populations now is going to far outweigh the cost of leaving populations unchecked and having to manage a larger problem later with no external funding for invasive species management. And ultimately, they want to make efficient use of their time and resources, too. I know here in Jefferson County, they're still kicking themselves for taking all that time this spring, spraying Angelica when they thought it was giant hogweed. So that was, you know, unfortunate. <laughs> so they, uh, this partnership ultimately has been very be beneficial to both our departments. And having open communication and shared resources in terms of GIS has really improved our countywide management of invasive species. Um, so we're continuing to work together at this time to collaborate on a countywide training workshop for local municipal road crews and parks departments um, with the hopes of doing that in the spring. And we're hoping to have everyone on the same page in terms of management techniques and roadsides and priorities um, on a countywide scale. And that's especially important to our highway department because they don't want to be managing things or doing their best to manage things in county right of ways, but then having municipalities with populations that are unchecked and just continuing to reinvade their management areas. So that's going to be really important going forward. Um, and we actually, you know, I've floated that idea to a few departments and have found that that's something that it seems like everyone is um, really feeling a need for. So I think that is going to be a good next step. Um, so the biggest things that they've let me know that were helpful for them as a result of this partnership have been plant identification and learning the importance of plant life cycle in management decisions, but also having that direction to create a systematic approach to mowing and spring that results in the most effective management strategy. Um, so I feel like this partnership is headed in a really good direction, and I know there's still more opportunities to take advantage of, and I'm excited to see how that continues to grow. So last slide, please. So that wraps it up for me. Thanks for your time, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.